uh, Ben, what have you done lately? Well, I, at the moment, and this is kind of a funny story, and this is also kind of pandemic related, but um, a, a, a bit into lockdown. So I think maybe um, some point in 2020, I, I, you know, you, you, maybe maybe people on the stream don't know this, but um, about hmm, 12 years ago, I wrote a book with with Martin Verberg called The Well-Grounded Java Developer, and and this was came out at a time when when Java 7 was just about to be released, and Java 7, the betas for Java 7 were like the new hotness, um, and 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 so I wrote this book with Martin. It was our first book, and and that was kind of one of the things which kind of set us on our path. To all the adventures that we had over the over the ten years after that, and occasionally, you know, the publisher would say, "Yeah, hey Ben, how about a thinking about a second edition?" And of course, during lockdown, can't go anywhere, not much happening. <laughs> you know, it seems like a good project, and I, I, you know, I draw up a plan, and I think mm, there's going to be, I don't know, maybe uh, some things have changed, and you know, there's a lot to cover, but it'll it'll be maybe forty percent new material and about sixty percent the same. Um, and boy, did I get that wrong, because. <laughs> I, I, we started the project in 2020, and I thought it would be done by the by, by you know sort of early 2021 at the very very latest, and then I'll be able to focus on thinking about doing something a book or, or some other project to tie in with Java 17 when it came out, um, and you know because you you know that I also also write the Java in a nutshell uh, book for O'Reilly, so I'm thinking well maybe maybe there'll be an eighth edition for for Java 17, um, and so the end of 2020 came and went, and it started to dawn on me that that actually. This wasn't forty percent new material, and actually, a lot of, lots of things had changed because, like in the original edition, we do three non-Java languages: we do Groovy, we do um, Scala, and we do Clojure. And that, the first big kind of realization was: well, do we really need all three of those languages? What you know, what's changed? And if you cast your mind back, you know, for, for for the younger developers, I think this might be before they they really became Java developers. But for us old guys, it's it's uh, you might remember that when Java Seven came out, there were no Lambda expressions. And so there were a lot of people who wanted a better Java, a better mousetrap. And in those days, lots of those people adopted Scala. Okay, mm -hmm. and since then, Scala has gone in a kind of a different direction. And it's now a language which is very much kind of for people that want to write Haskell on the JVM. Um, and now the people who like Java but want something which is just a bit more refreshed and a bit more modern, a lot of them pick up Kotlin. So we're like, okay, well, Groovy, we, maybe we can get rid of, of Groovy and maybe do, you know, we do Kotlin, but then do we really do Scala as well? Because the syntax of the two languages, at least you know, at an introductory level, is quite similar. So wouldn't there just be a lot of repetition? Wouldn't it kind of be boring? And do we really want to get into like the high level, deep, deep, deep Haskell on the JVM kind of functional programming stuff that that's some of the Scala folks do? So we thought, mm, actually, maybe let's cut it down. Let's cut it down to two languages. We'll do Clojure, uh, which we'll keep from the first edition, and we'll do Kotlin as well. And then as time went on, we realized that the, the themes that we were looking at, the big themes, were functional programming, because that's something which has just exploded. And you know, people are curious about it and want to do it. And do we really do it on the JVM? It's it's hard to, to, to say. There's a, that's kind of a big topic in the book. And also concurrency. And so from the, the two languages, um, Java's perspective, Kotlin's perspective, and Clojure's perspective, it really comes together. And you can really see you know, a lot of, of different aspects of those two big topics. Um, and then we kind of mix in some stuff to do with internals and a bit of bytecode and some class loading and some deeper dive technical topics as well. But as we started to do this, we realized that we were just writing and writing and writing. So instead of being 40%, the new book is nearly twice as long as the original. So I've written not a book, but kind of a book and a half. So... So it's really, you know, it's just amazing. I mean, there is there is still quite a bit of material in there from the first edition, a, a bit, but now the book's twice as big. So, so if you if you do have the first edition, you know, you're definitely going to be getting your money's worth uh, for the new edition uh, as well. And and I suddenly realised that we were part way through 2021. It was approaching September. It was approaching the release date of Java 17. And I'm getting calls from my my, my publisher already going, "Hi, so do you want to do Java in a nutshell, eighth edition?" And I'm like, uh, yeah, definitely. Just let me finish typing this book. <laughs> so I ended up in a position which I never wanted to be in, which is I actually ended up having two books on the go at once. And as anyone will tell you, if you're a writer and an author, you should never do that. <laughs> but the good news is we are now, as of this week, uh, my, my newsletter, I can share two pieces of news. First of all, that the um, 
the, the well-grounded Java developer second edition, which is my, um, which is the book that's nearly finished, is back from final review, and it will be going out to production, and it will be finished in a matter of a couple of weeks' time. Well done. So that's well done. that's Great the big news. news. And then the other thing which I can share, and I don't think I've actually announced this yet publicly, so CodeCamp is the first time, um, is that the the eighth edition of Java in a nutshell, covering Java 17, is going into early access, early release, um, in I think next week. So that project is also happening, and you'll be able to get your hands on on chapters as we write them, as we update them, starting from next week as well. So that's awesome. that's that's awesome. my point is that's basically awesome. as we come out of of lockdown and I can start to go out, and I've timed it perfectly because the uh, you know the lockdown is easing up now, and I'll be able to get outside and drink beer in the sunshine, and 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 hopefully finish writing the eighth edition soon as well. So you've done quite a lot, I would say, right? So yeah, a lot of effort, a lot of. Uh, but where would we be without these kind of contributions, actually? I mean, um, by the way, so how do you learn? I mean, I mean, it's a basic question, you know. But it, it always strikes me that I find new opportunities and new sources of learning. And how do you keep yourself, you know, in shape? Well, that's. That's interesting. I mean, so the first thing I should say is that I have no qualifications in computing or computer science of any kind. I am entirely self-taught. Um, and I have never taken a, a computing degree or, a, you know, even like a, a school class in, in, in computing. So I've always just just tried to, to learn by, by doing stuff and just by getting involved. And even if my initial attempts aren't very good or I haven't fully understood something, you just it's a, it's an iterative process. And, and this goes back to, and, and this actually was something that we, we found when we were writing The Well-Grounded Java Developer, and also my book, Optimizing Java, which is my Java performance book, is that I sometimes want to dig into a subject and I see something that people people say, you know, you read in, in technical blogs and so forth, and, and, and you see the same advice, the same idea in, in several places. And sometimes I think, well, hang on a minute, is that actually really true? Hmm. Um, because there is a danger when, when people just re repeat and copy stuff that they see without someone actually checking the source uh, that, that something, you know, that, that actually it won't be true or some, 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 some uh, weird advice can get propagated. Uh, and I'll give you a, a, an actual concrete example of that. Um, there's a piece of, of tuning advice um, for Cassandra. And if you read like the, 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 the NoSQL database, right? And if you read Cassandra performance blog, sooner or later, you'll, you'll run across this piece of advice. Not going to repeat what the advice is for a reason you're about to find out. Okay, so I saw this, and when I was working at New Relic, um, I'm rocking the shirt here. This is one of my old New Relic shirts, which I, I still wear, despite the fact I work at Red Hat now, um, because it's super comfortable. Um, when I was working at, at, at New Relic, I saw this piece of, of Cassandra advice, and the Cassandra folks were putting it into production, and I'm like, okay, so where does this come from? And they're like, well, it, look, it says here in the Cassandra performance blog. And I'm like, okay, but that doesn't make any sense to me from what I know about the JVM. So I dug into it and I could find that this piece of advice, it was just like a meme. It had kind of been repeated and repeated and repeated in the blogs. And by this stage, you see, this is where this aspect of my personality kicks in. I've got to know the answer, right? I've got to go and find out where this thing comes from and is it really true and, and how did people come to this conclusion? So I find myself staying up late, diving through the bug tracker, the Cassandra Jira, Right and finding old issues which reference this, and I follow this 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 trail of breadcrumbs all the way back to the original issue where this is first re reported. And someone says, if you do this change, it will improve performance. And there are five pages of comments, and the final comment is closing can't reproduce. <laughs> and yet this is out there. This is completely standard received wisdom, and there is no evidence for it whatsoever. Yeah, so. So that attitude, that thing of, of sometimes, you know, and, and there are other aspects of it. When I was writing Optimizing Java, I, there are things where I've had to dig into the hotspot source code to, to justify a point. I've seen a point made that people have talked about in blogs. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to put it in my book unless I know that it's actually factually true. So I have to kind of have that basis and that, 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 that feeling that actually I've done everything I can to make sure that what I'm saying is factually accurate and that I'm, that I'm not just repeating things I've heard. Mm -hmm. um, the other one, which I, I, I'll tell you because just because it's a funny story. Um, when I was at New Relic, we, we had the ability to, to, to see the configurations that the customers sent in uh, data. 
So I've I've looked at the production configurations and done statistical analysis on tens of millions of JVMs. So not a self-selected sample where people do a survey and they tell you what they're doing. I know what people actually do. Um, and and you're gonna you like in the top ten sizes for containers. So you know when you when you size your container or your heap size, I should say. Does it does it, it, somewhere in the top ten is a heap size in megabytes that you will never ever guess, right? You can't you can't guess, right? I'll tell you, we I, I won't waste your time by by having you guess, but I'll just tell you what the size is, and then you'll see you'll see why. Um, one of the top ten heap sizes available that people use in production is eight hundred and nineteen megabytes. Eight hundred and nineteen. Yeah. So do you, do you see what's happened? Do you see what's happened with that? I, eight, eight what one number, nine. It's it's eight one nine, right? Mm -hmm. Now what they meant was eight one nine two, eight gig. Exactly. Exactly. Right? And where is it and, too? Yeah. And mm -hmm. what's happened? Someone has typed up a blog entry, and they've written their container size, and they've typoed. And their container size, they should have written 8192 and they've cut and pasted it and they've lost the two. And that, that yes. has gone into a blog which has been endlessly repeated around the blogosphere. Oh my God. And now there are hundreds of thousands of people running 819 for no reason at all. <laughs> the industry running on copy and paste, huh? Oh. Well, it's dangerous. That's it's, dangerous. Yeah. yeah. So, so this is what I, what I want to do. I want to bring some rigor. I want to bring some, you know, some, uh, some science to it. You know, because the other part of that, you see, there's, there's two sides to the 819 story. There's that piece, right? But there's also the other other side of it, which is, you know, as a performance engineer, does it matter, right? The, the, the JVM is such an incredible piece of software. It's so powerful. It's so adaptive that it can just deal with that. Okay, I'm running in a funny, tiny container size. Okay, I'll just keep on running, right? Mm -hmm. And most of the time, those problems haven't been found and corrected because the JVM is just able to cope. Uh, and actually on most workloads, until you start to really push it, you won't feel this, the, the pain of that small container size in normal operation. Mm -hmm. So that's the other that's the other story. That's the other piece of that you, 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 know, you can take away. It's interesting. I mean, it, it looks like a, you know, uh, a scaled test, you know, <laughs> um, done intentionally by the uh, 819 <laughs> guy. You know? Well, it would be it would be nice to think so, but I think it was more, almost certainly more just a, a copy and paste uh, 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 screw up. So, <laughs> absolutely. So yeah. So what what else can we can we talk about? I mean, uh, you know, I'm uh, the other thing that I've been doing quite a lot of at the moment is is observability um, and open telemetry and all of those things, which are um, you know I think are going to be really really important to Java developers in the coming coming months and years. Um, so we can talk about that and some of the open source work if, if that's, or Absolutely. we can talk about whatever. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But but first, what's modern Java? Just a summary. I mean, because that's also how you, you know, introduce. Uh... Yeah, um, it's it's a tricky one because what does it mean? I mean, you know, it's, there's an old saying in software architecture, right? You should never name anything new, fast, next generation, or any words like that, right? And because there will always be something, yeah. Yep. So, so and it's true, right? Because the Paris um, is called um, the New Bridge, and it was built, I think, in the 14th century. The Pont Neuf in Paris, um, mm -hmm. it means New Bridge. Uh, yeah, and it's, it's because, but it always happens because what you know, you build something to replace the old system, and then eventually. The system will be will itself be replaced. You know, when I was at Morgan Stanley, we had something called the next generation internet plan, and by the time I left there, people were already you know thinking of it as the as the legacy plan. So, so that's why you know the, the word modern is kind of loaded. Um, and if you talk to Brian uh, Getz about this, he will he he has a particular aversion to the word modern. So whenever I'm talking to him, I kind of remember to not to say modern because he, he brings him out in a in a rash or something. Um, but but yeah, so what is modern Java? Well, different things to different people. You know, for some people, they're, they are, they are they're, they're, well, some people are, are still even migrating onto eight, um, which I find, you know, it's it, it's a small part of, of the industry, I would say. 
Um, but there are still verticals, there are still niches where people are, are, are still very slow moving because of regulatory and support and other, other concerns. But I would think that most people, I mean, looking at the numbers, um, based on what I saw just before I left New Relic, 11 had just about overtaken eight, at least on, on, on that customer base. And if that's a reasonable proxy for the market, which I, I kind of feel like it is, um, that means that 11 is sort of the baseline that people expect now. And now, of course, we have a 17. I have se never seen any evidence that anyone really, honestly, in production adopts a non-LTS release. Mm -hmm. So everybody goes 8 to 11 to 17. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, there are good reasons for that because... And I, I, I hear the, the debate about this, but it, I, I think that there, that there is a bit of nuance that's being lost here, uh, which is firstly about human nature, you know, and secondly about about risk. On the human nature side of things, engineering managers mostly see a Java version upgrade as uh, as as pure cost, right? As as make work that has to be done, and they don't want to do it all that often, right? That's the first thing, you know, a major upgrade from eight to eleven every three years. Okay, sure, you know. It gets and it gets scheduled in and it gets thought about as a major item in the uh, in the engineering calendar, right? Now maybe you know, and, and the Oracle guys say, oh no no no, it's fine. All the releases are tested the same way. It shouldn't be a major thing. It should just be like a ticking over of a version, and it should be fine. Okay, sure, <clears throat> and that might well be true, um, but that's not how people perceive it. Um, so it's about changing of that perception, and that is a hugely long term project, I would say. Um, and good luck to them. Um, changing human nature is extremely hard to do, um, and engineering managers are risk averse. Um, which brings us to the second problem to do with the, the release cycle, in, in my opinion, um, which is if I have my, 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 my version LTS that I'm happy on, and I've got another component that I depend upon, which is absolutely essential, some vendor component or open source or whatever, the JDK releases LTS plus one. Okay, great. Well, I can't move until my, my, my other critical component is also on LTS plus one. Okay, so they bring a release out. Now they're both on LTS one and I can, I can go up to LTS plus one, brilliant. Six months rolls around, LTS plus two comes out. The JDK is now at LTS plus two. They're rolling, they're rolling. Yeah. Right, but my, my component is not. So the, so the other component that I depend upon is still, is still only technically supports LTS plus one. I'm now stuck. I cannot move to LTS plus two, but now the situation is different because LTS plus one is end of life. Those releases only live for six months. So if a CVE is found in LTS plus one, the JDK level, Oracle's response is, sorry, you've got to upgrade. We are not, we are not providing security patches for that, even for CVEs, right? So at that point, what do you do? You can't, migrate forwards because your critical component doesn't support that version and you are stuck on an out uh, an end of life version with 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 a, a cve with no patch that is not a risk decision that i think many people are comfortable with taking um that's my that's my problem and that's why i see people only upgrading lts to lts mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and we see a, a a question here in the chat okay. uh, regarding to versioning and, and specifically to, to kotlin which refers to you know, it looks like Kotlin is uh, delivering uh, faster new features. Okay. Well, that's that depends on what you want, right? There are many ways of looking at this. Um, if you are the sort of person that likes to experiment with new features and wants thing, new features faster, Kotlin could well be a, a very nice language for you. Um, but the thing about Java is that Java is is sees its slower moving, more considered, more small C conservative status as a feature the general feeling is is let everybody else be the first to experiment with those features and find out what works and what doesn't right what you you get i think the, you know the, the same could be that in java you get the best version of a feature not necessarily the quickest yeah, yeah. and it, it's also true that um because java when you, you a new release of jdk it's not just a new release of the java language but it's also a new release of the jvm so there can be features which are, well, I hesitate to say syntactic sugar, um, but there are features which are, are released in, 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 in Kotlin or Scala, um, which 
do not have true VM level support. So one feature, you know, for, for example, could be Scala's case classes or Kotlin's data classes, right? They are, um, they generate a bunch of bytecode, but they are, they are basically just regular classes. When you analyze their compiled form, they're just a class. Whereas when Java released records, records actually have some support, mm -hmm. right? Because records have a VM level guarantee that they are um, what Kotlin's data classes aspire to be which is a transparent carrier of fields, right? So, so things like, and, and this is forward looking, um, the deconstruction of a record, the fact that you know that you can always break a, a record apart again, that there is no, you know, the, 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 the essentially records don't participate in any sort of, of possible magic serialization mechanism. And instead they are just a bunch of fields that you can break apart and reconstitute. That's a VM level guarantee. You know, another example would be, um, Kotlin coroutines. Um, and Kotlin coroutines, if you look at how they're implemented, they're actually implemented with something of a compiler trick. They, they actually transform the, 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 the coroutine based style um, into something which is actually a state machine in bytecode. So if you decompile a, a Kotlin coroutine call, you will see that there is actually a state machine in there. Um, whereas Project Loom, which you could kind of build coroutines on top of, that is now at the VM level. And it actually goes further than this because what, what, we, what we've also seen happening, it's happened several times, I'll do a Scala example this time, is that some uh, languages like, like Scala, they start off with a feature. Uh, in Scala's case, the one I'm going to talk about is traits. Um, and they, they have to build it on top of the existing Java framework, which they did for Java 7 and Java 6. But then when, it, when, when the, 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 the JVM releases a new version, in this case, Java 8, which has default methods, Scala was able to change their implementation of how their trait mechanism works so that a stateless trait, i.e. a trait with no fields in Scala, just becomes an interface with default methods on it. So there's all of this stuff which, which is able to go. And it's, it, there's no competition here. There's you know, this, you know, only a healthy, sort of everybody keeping up with each other and a sort of every everybody running in the same direction where you can try out ideas in one language and you can borrow them and and you know in fact at the conclusion of the the, the well-grounded java developer the new edition i make reference to that that phrase um uh, great artist steel which of course is it's attributed to steve jobs right but he didn't come up with it he just <laughs> borrowed it or stole it from somewhere else um and like I said, I like to get to the bottom of things. So when I started to think about that and to think about that and as it applies to language design and how languages borrow or steal from each other, I needed to know where the root of that quote was. So I needed to find out where did Steve Jobs get that from? And if you want to know the answer, buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Oh. All I will say is it's a surprising place that it comes from. Um, so, 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 so yeah. Um, but that's that's you won't all say it. Anything. Like, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. that's that's how it that's how it works. It um, languages borrow from each other. This is this is a collaborative um, environment, you know. And people talk to each other. We talk at conferences, um, you know. There, there, and there is a rich body of, of of language design activity. I mean, I am I am totally just a, a spectator and a, a kibitzer on this. I, I I don't do any any language design work myself. I just. I merely appreciate the work that is done, and I, I, you know, I hope I have a reasonable eye for it. Mm -hmm. Good, 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 I mean, uh, very insightful. I feel like I'm warmed up now. I'm ready for a, you know, one of the tough talks, you know, about concurrency. Concurrence. Concurrency, one, one of the hard things ever, right? I mean, every engineer needs to deal with concurrency at the beginning. It's awful. It, it, it's a world which is totally well, complicated and so on. Let's. That's, Let's that's interesting. If possible. Yeah, it's, uh... that's 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 interesting though because you asked about about modern Java, but then of course there's the subject of future Java, and what is going to come after Java 17? Because as as people pro probably know, there are, there are kind of four big projects that are happening in OpenJDK right now, which represent the future of the Java that we'll write in five years time, and I think that the, the Java we're going to write in five years time is actually going to look very very different to the Java of today. I think Java 17 already looks different substantially different from Java 8. So idiomatic, let, actually, let, let me put, let me phrase it this way. Idiomatic Java 17 
is a very different language to idiomatic Java 8. And I think that the, the, the language which is five years on from Java 17, so, so the Java of, of 2027, um, I think is going to look very different again. Um, and the, the reason for that, and I, I will come back to concurrency in a second, is that there are, there are four projects going on in OpenJDK which, which, which provide that. And they're called Amber, uh, Valhalla, um, Loom, and Panama. Yeah, so you can Google for those. If you Google OpenJDK Loom or OpenJDK Panama or Amber or Valhalla, you will find out all about them. One of them is actually about concurrency. So the complexity that you, you talk about uh, with, 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 with complexity and how, uh, with concurrency and how Java developers are, are forced to deal with it, Loom is supposed to help with that a lot. It draws, and again, we're back to the theme about stealing ideas from other places. One of the things that it, it most closely resembles um, is actually from Go. And people talk about Go routines. Hmm. Um, and actually, Loom is Java's answer to what would a Go routine look like in, 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 in Java if it had JDK levels, if it had JVM level support. Um, and basically, it's the idea, because it, for, for people that don't know and don't know any Go, um, Go is like a fire and forget mechanism, the Go routine. You just fire it off and say, go and do something and just, I don't care, just go and go and handle it. Um, and that's that's what we're getting in Java. We're getting a new thing which looks like a thread. And in fact, it is an instance of thread. But it's called a, th a thing called a virtual thread. And it effectively is quite similar to um, to, to a Go routine, in, at least conceptually. Um, but it, it, it basically, it, it, it's called a virtual thread because it isn't exactly an operating system thread. Hmm. Mm -hmm. The way, the way that, that this has been approached and the design is actually pretty pretty nice is to realize that there's a hard limit on how many threads you can have in your, your VM, right? Because every time you create a thread, every time you call thread.start, the operating system gets involved and it allocates, well, a minimum, you can tweak it, but it allo allocates a chunk of stack space to hold memory in the process space for that thread. So what, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna, you know, you allocate that, that, that space, let's suppose it's two meg, which is the default, um, you allocate a thousand threads. That's two gig just for the stack spaces of your threads. So how, how high can you go? Can you go to 10,000 threads? All right, well, maybe you shrink, shrink the space down to, I don't know, 512K. You have 10,000 threads, 20,000 threads. You, you're going to run out of memory. The system is going to not be able to cope with that, the operating system, if you just keep adding threads. You certainly can't do a million threads, right? But you could easily conceive of having a million executable objects or a million tasks in process. You know, you could even conceive, conceive on a, a huge server class machine of having a million open connections at once. Yeah. So threads are a bottleneck, and, and that's what the virtualization approach it, it, it aims to do: is to, to 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 say, okay, when I create this type of new thread called a virtual thread, don't involve the operating system, don't take up the operating system's finite resources, and instead the JVM is going to manage it and and just and will will we'll control the you know the, the 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 resource utilization that would otherwise you know just blow out of control by creating so many of these so yeah so i think it's um that's part of the story concurrency and also that's that's why we talk about concurrency so much in the book um functional programming i think is still going to be a an interesting one i i fundamentally feel like What's going to happen is that, that that Java will get a bit more functional, but I believe that the design of Java and just the feel of the language ultimately will constrain it from getting like it's not going to turn into Haskell. Right? There are things like, for example, recursion and the way that that's implemented on the JVM, which which just don't don't go well for the more advanced forms of functional programming. But we have map and filter and reduce, and we're going to get pattern matching and you know sealed classes and records and all of that stuff's good. And that's sort of functional. Um, if, we may, if I may ask, I mean, is mm. this the purpose in itself, I mean, to become more functional? I mean, to, because it, it looks like, well, being functional is a very nice thing. It's, it's very useful, of course, and so on. But, well, it's really changing the, well, enhancing the, the language, right? I, but, I think that, you know, basically my, my approach to this is, is that the, the functional programming is well, let me start from, from, from OO, from object orientation, right? We can think of a language, Java, you know, Java's OO, yeah. C++ is OO, yeah. Python is OO, yes. Ruby, yes, right? JavaScript, okay? <laughs> Each of those, Perl 
is OO, right? Each of those languages has a different sense of what it means to be OO. Um, they don't all agree. They mostly overlap, but they but there are gaps, and not every language fulfills the sense of being OO in the same way. JavaScript has no classes, right? It's all prototypes. I mean, yes, there's a class keyword, but it's syntactic sugar. It's prototypes underneath, right? Perl, Perl has no encapsulation um, at all. Um, in Java, when you define a class as a, as a, a template, as a blueprint for a, I shouldn't say template, as a blueprint for, for objects, um, that is fixed. All objects of a given class have the same fields and the same methods, and you cannot change that. If you want to vary the fields or methods, subclass. There's no other mechanism for that. Whereas in, in Ruby, you can take an instance of a class and you can attach a new method to it or redefine a method. That's so, so that we don't have the same sense of what it means. And yet, we all agree that all of those languages are OO. So now take that thinking and apply it to functional programming. Mm -hmm. what, what is functional? OK, well, the table stakes are I can represent some code as though it was data. OK, those are pretty low table stakes. Pretty much any language in 2022 can hit that. So is everything functional or is nothing functional? We have to do a bit better than that. So we have to, to think about gradations and, and shades of gray and more or less functional. And, and what does it feel like? And to me, I describe Java as a slightly functional language because you have map and you have filter and you have reduce and you have streams and, 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 and so on, right? But at the same time, the Java core collections are in no way functional, right? They are imperative collections. You, they mutate, they have state, you have an iterator, which is not a functional construct at all. Um, you don't have the, 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 the functional operations like filter, map, and reduce. Do not sit directly on the, the collections. They sit on this new abstraction called a stream. And streams are a bit kind of bolted on. Mm -hmm. The way that I always think about a Java stream is it's like uh, it's kind of like Star Wars, right? You go into hyperspace. When you call dot stream on a collection, suddenly you're in hyperspace. And everything is lazy, everything is functional. You have all these operations and you can do all this stuff. And at the end, you call collect or to list or reduce or any other kind of terminal operation on a stream. And you jump out of hyperspace back into normal space. Yeah, so that's, that's it's a powerful technique, um, but it's not very natural and it doesn't necessarily sit uh, exactly the same on the, uh, you know, with, with the rest of the language. Whereas with something like, like, like Haskell, right? It's all lazy. It's all functional all the time. So, so there are different languages here. Uh, Scala, you know, does does takes things in a, in a different direction. Um, but one of the, the things about JVM based functional languages is that each one has to make a decision, a trade off, about how closely they're going to stick to the Java interoperability, uh, and in particular the collections, because the collections are just this big imperative beast um, that you know that doesn't fit well to, to functional operations um so and even things like immutability are difficult with in java because the the collections define things like add and remove and and, and so on and those are mutating operations so if you're going to implement list in java you are going to um you know you're going to get mutating methods so if you have an immutable list all it can do is throw unsupported operation exception Right, which is a runtime exception. So I can't. If you give me an instance of a list, I can't tell you without trying whether or not it's going to, to to throw if I if I try to mutate it. There's nothing in the type of it which tells me, "Hey, I'm I'm immutable. Don't try and do anything to me." Or better yet, I just don't have the methods that would require me. You, you know, that would allow you to mutate me. So this notion of, of, of what is functional and what is not is, I think, more complex and more subtle um, than, than lots of people sometimes give it credit for. You know, it's great we have map and filter and, and reduce. You know, people like them. So, but is it is it functional? Well, my question is, is it functional enough for what people want to do with it? Java is and always has been a mainstream language. It is, it is a, you know, it's that old um, James Gosling quote that Java is a blue collar language. It's a, it's a, a program, it's a programming language for people who build real world business applications. And yes, 
you can do all sorts of cool and clever things with it and it can be incredibly intellectually interesting and and very creative and fascinating and all of those things don't forget what it is it is a language for building working production rock solid applications and so therefore questions about whether it's functional are really you know secondary to the question about about whether whether it gets the job done yeah, very clear from my perspective. It looks like we have another question from the from the audience. So again, Kotlin uh, seems to be like very appealing for for people yep. for various reasons. But um, yeah, a, a lot of rappers in in, in Java. Uh, what do we think? I mean, what do you think about the future? Uh, yep. Will we have like less boilerplate? Okay. Um. So I I'm going to go back to the four projects that I talked about. You know, um, Amber, Valhalla. We talked about Loom already, Panama. The one that I'm going to talk about here is Valhalla. And we're doing, kind of doing these out of order, but it doesn't really matter. Valhalla is the largest and the most ambitious and the most complex of all four of the projects because it fundamentally reimagines Java's data model at, 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 at a, you know, at a very, very uh, low level. Um, so, uh, so what I mean by that is in Java, we have two types of values. We have primitives, which are bit patterns, and how you interpret the bit pattern depends upon the type of the primitive, but they're all just bit patterns. Um, and you have object references, which are typed pointers into a specific area of memory. Right? Those are your two data values. There are no others. Everything in Java, when you, when you, when you look at it, is one of those two types of value. Um, Valhalla is an answer to a question, what if we wanted to change that? And what if we change that means modifying the JVM and the language and the memory model and everything at fundamental levels. It is open heart surgery on the entire platform and ecosystem and the VM and the language. OK, so what can we why would we want to do that? What's what's important about it and how does it relate to optional? OK, well, optional is, of course, a reference type. So optional, you know, when you, when you have an optional, you have an object in the heap. Um, and when you have, whether you have a Java object in the heap, you have an object header. Unlike C++, in Java, it is impossible to create a heap object without also allocating a header for it. There is no way to do it. So what we're actually wanting to do is to, to say, can we, can we change that? Can we have objects in the heap which don't have headers? Can we somehow save? You know, so, so, so one place this would show up, for example, would be in the boxing of integers. You know, if, you, if you have an int as a bit pattern, it's four bytes, it's 32 bits. Um, if you have an integer, it's 32 bits plus whatever the size of the header is, which you can, under most circumstances, will be 12 bytes on a modern system. So you pay, you pay four bytes for the int and you pay 12 bytes for the header. So your overhead at, when dealing with, with an array of integers, let's say, versus an array of ints, is 3x. And of course, there are all those pointer interactions, which tend to cause you nasty performance problems. Um, optional is very similar to, an, to the integer case, because you store the value, and then you have to pay the header. And what's the optional? It's just a box. It's just a box which may or may not contain something. So it's not actually adding any value. So I think that, that, that a lot of the, the optional and a lot of those wrapper types, and that also, by the way, applies to the integers and the, the box primitives. Will, will be done away with by Valhalla, and, and I could talk all, like all afternoon about Valhalla um, because it's it's technically interesting. It's also extremely ambitious, and it might not work out the way that people think it, it does. One big surprise, for example, is people thought that there were going to be a third type of new value: bit patterns, object references as we know them today, and headerless objects. Well, it turns out that that's not quite true. And actually, instead of one new new form of data, you actually need two, mm. um, that, which I, I was I was su surprised by, it, and that fell out of, of a, a design process. I mean, Valhalla has been running for at least seven years now. Um, the first pieces of it are starting to to make their way towards something that could be um, could be brought into mainline, but it's a long way to go yet. Um, so again, I write about it a bit in in uh, the background of Java developer in the final chapter. Um, we talk, you know, I talked about it. I, I write about it from time to time on Oracle's Java magazine. Um, but it's it's really Valhalla that's going to help 
from a performance side, deal with all of those optionals and things. Mm -hmm. it, it should also be pointed out that optional is is also related to the functional programming aspect as well, because you know the something which is there or not is is a is a much more functional way rather than having to deal with null. Excellent. Um, I think that that uh, concludes the answer of the uh, to this question. So we covered concurrency. Uh, we've discussed a little bit about functional. Should we explore a bit uh, more the languages? Sure. Yeah, I wanted to ask if uh, I know. So we can all agree that Java gets the job done. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you're looking at a different uh, language uh, for your project, what what aspects would you take into account or? How well, I mean, this this is one of those great questions. Like everything else in software, the answer is it depends. <laughs> yeah. So so remember that software is is a you know is a human activity. So so those factors are are, are you know very important. What are we building? Who is it for? How long is it going to be around? How big is it? Um, what what is its quality factor? Are we building a prototype that we're just going to you know? A, a, you know, because this 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 question is is multidimensional, right? We could be a tiny startup looking for for seed funding, okay. In which case, the correct language for your project is whatever the team already knows, because what you what you're doing is you're doing something as quickly as you can in order to to you know to to, to maximize your runway and to um to make to give you as much time as possible to get the money you need, okay. If you are a a, a, a large organization in a heavily regulated industry. And you already have a load of systems in Java. Well, the answer is Java, um, because when you are in those those types of situations, I, I remember when I was a, a, a young, um, dashing developer at Morgan Stanley. One of the first things they told me was that that the average length of time, the average, not the, the maximum, but the average length of time that a system would stay in production was seven years. So if you want to bring a new language in. You are paying not only for the system cost, you are also paying for the support costs for maintaining expertise in the bank for those seven years. And that is the cost you have to justify, not the technical decision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and and sometimes it's worth it. Sometimes it's worth paying those those, those overheads. But be very sure, go into it with, with your eyes open. So those those are my, you know, obviously I said nothing here at all about, about programming or about, about killer language features. You know, because well, we go back to what we said earlier that languages steal from each other, and um, you know, something which is a killer language feature today, a new version of one, another language may come out in twelve months' time, which actually has the same feature. So you, you've paid the cost of retraining people and bringing them on, you know, in order to 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 to, to steal a march and use this feature for twelve months. Okay, was it worth it? Maybe, um, or would it have been better to code around it for twelve months and then and then use it when it when it came up? You know, availability of skills is also another huge thing. Um, relative cost of programmers. Programmers in certain languages do attract higher salaries. Um, you know, if you are a closure programmer, you know, you, there, 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 are, there are more closure jobs than there are programmers by quite some way. So closure programmers tend to get paid really quite well. Um, you know, but then you also have the problem of, well, how big is the team? How easily can the team cope with being down a person? If you are the only closure team in in a Java shop, and somebody breaks a leg or leaves the company, or you know has paternity leave, then how easy is it for the team to cover that absence? Could you get a contractor in to cover that? What would that cost? How easy would it be to find a contractor that could fit into that? Yeah, and you know there are there's also the the, the question of are you are you building your application is your entire architecture centered on one particular technology? Apache Spark, for example, Spark is written in Scala. So there could well be good reasons where if your architecture is, we're all in on, Scar on Spark, Spark is, is, is the core of everything we're going to build up around it. Okay, well, maybe maybe that would be a good technical reason to pick Scala for your, um, as your programming language of choice. I mean, Ben, what other reasons are you know behind deciding uh, using Scala <laughs> other than Spark. I, I'm just curious because nowadays I'm just seeing Scala, you know, in, in this context, to be honest. And it's all, all, all always a battle, Scala or Python. That's mm -hmm. it in this area. And it's it's very strange to me, you know, uh, the way that history plays out because 
to my mind, and I, I, you know, I like Python. I write, I write a certain amount of Python. Um, but it seems to me that it was just really a lucky accident that Python has such tight bindings to C APIs. Yeah. So, or its success in the big data area really was about the fact that there were existing low-level C and C++ libraries that Python was capable of easily wrapping. And that, I think, is what got it start. And then people started to go down. Python is a very old language. And to someone like me who's been, been, been programming for over 30 years, Python feels like an old language. It, it, you know, it's that, that question about, about modern and, uh, and is it a modern language? Well, you know, they, they added- the adoption rate. Uh, in the well, past years, looks like wow, it's the it's their language somehow. I mean, <laughs> and it's 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 easy to learn. Um, it has it has its quirks. Um, it has a lot of good qualities. Um, I, you know, a, a piece of background before. I mean, I mean, I'm known for my work in in, in Java and JVM, but I, I actually spent a number of years when I first graduated, um, uh, or more accurately, dropped out of my PhD to go write web websites. Um, writing Perl. So I know the Perl language, you know, actually really pretty well, even I'm rusty as hell, but I could still write it. And so when I started to pick up Python, I was able to contrast it, not only with Java and the other languages that I knew, but also with Perl, which is a very similar language in, in many ways. Um, and I think it's really a, a lucky accident. I think in a different universe, where the, the Perl C API was a little better, and people have been more receptive to picking up data science, we could all be writing Perl instead of Python. <laughs> um, so a lot of this has to do with network effects and the fact that because Python is popular, people come to it. Um, and because it is easy to use for, for people that don't have any programming experience, um, you know, all of those things contribute to it, to, to its success. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Good, good. So, well, I mean, uh, if we were to try to summarize, so languages for the JVM, what are the obvious, you know, choices when thinking of, I don't know, Scala, Closure, and all the other? And of course, for everything and for the majority of the things, there is Java, of course. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I mean, so one of the things, there's a couple of things here. So, so first of all, I want to want to talk about. Um, there's a, a set of rankings which are produced by the analyst firm called Redmonk. Mm -hmm. And every year, Redmonk produced the programming language rankings. I think they do it twice a year. Um, and they're, you know, they're, they, they do the best they can. It's very difficult to get um, mm -hmm. accurate data. And they're open about, about the, you know, the, the strengths and also the weaknesses of the methodology. Um, but, but what they do, I think, is you know, a good rough indicator. I mean, there are were, there were no brilliant signals in here. We just, we're just kind of trying to feel our way through through what is a very large space without without the possibility of getting very clear indicators, um, so so it's it's a data point, um, but it is interesting that in the top twenty languages, you have um, Java, Scala, uh, Groovy, Kotlin. That's four. That is twenty percent of the top twenty programming languages run on the JVM by just just, just four out of twenty. Right, and then Clojure is just outside, so it's like twenty-one or twenty-two. Mm -hmm. So, so that's that's amazing. Like the fact that we have this platform that we can do that on, it first of all should should tell us something. Um, now, of course, just because they're all in the top twenty, it doesn't mean they're all the same size. They're absolutely not. Um, uh, the Pareto principle applies here as much as it does anywhere else. Java is by far and away the biggest language. Um, you know, and I think Scala is maybe 1% of the size of the Java community. But you have to think about the scale of that. If Java is 10 million developers worldwide, give or take, 1% um, of that is 100,000. 100,000 worldwide developers is a, you know, a huge and sustainable community. So, so there's that scale, is understanding how big the problem is. The second thing is, you know, the, the, the picture is not static, right? The, the, there are still more and more programs. We still need more programmers than we have. The, the industry, the, the software development industry continues to grow despite everything, despite pandemics, despite economic slowdowns, we still continue to grow as an industry as a whole. And the economics for a growing pie are different to the economics of a static pie. 
In a static pie, you say, oh, you know, this language is winning, this one is losing, because you're taking developers away from each other. But in a, in, in a world where more and more developers are coming to the profession each year, that's no longer true. Um, so that's hugely important. Um, the third point I want to make a bit is about Kotlin. And Kotlin's always interesting to me because, of course, it got its start um, in Android. And, you know, basically, I, I think that it's, it's fair to say that, that one of the reasons for that is because Google were unhappy with still having so much of their, their developer base tied to a language which was subject to litigation, frankly. Um, so I can understand why strategically from them it would have made sense to encourage Kotlin as a language which which wasn't owned by Oracle. Um, so 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 yeah, that's where that's where where Kotlin got its start from. Um, and I'm always surprised that it doesn't cross over more into the server side community. Um, most of the Kotlin developers out there, most of the the adoption that we see on surveys like Redmonk is is from from the fact that, that Kotlin is used for Android. So when we see when we see Kotlin in 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 that in that survey. It's mostly Android, mm -hmm. um, which is is not quite the same as, as Java. You know, the the, the Android and the, the the JVM worlds have diverged quite considerably. Um, so, I, would I like to see more Kotlin on the server side? Yeah, absolutely. I like Kotlin. I I, I write it um, from time to time, um, and and yeah, and and so I think probably Kotlin is now the second largest language because of that Android effect, um, with Scala third and Groovy fourth. And then Clojure is, I think, quite a long way back behind behind Groovy, but it's it's probably the fifth largest one. Awesome conversation. I mean, we'll have, I would be eager to continue it for hours and hours, and I, I'm afraid we just have time for one final question from, from sure. our audience. What do you think about the oh. cloud native Java frameworks? And do you see any potential yeah. in this native approach? Right. So, so, so this is a great question. Thank you, whoever asked this. This was this is an awesome one to finish on. Thank you, uh, Alexandru. Um, because what you've done is you used the word native here twice, right? You've said a cloud native Java web web framework, and then you say you mentioned the native approach, right? So there's there's two ways of using native. You can say cloud native, right, or you can say native by itself. Native by itself refers to, it, 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 if I'm understanding you correctly, refers to the compilation of Java bytecode into um, machine code essentially ahead of time. So like to compile a Java program the way that we would compile a Go program and end up with an actual binary, which is, is machine code and no longer has an interpreter and a JIT compiler in it. Okay, so assuming that's what you meant, which, which I'm gonna do, I wanna just separate those out a bit because yes, native could form part of a cloud native approach but it's not the only thing which goes into cloud native. Cloud native means something which has been designed natively to, to, to run well in the cloud. Now, this is an area where, because of the nature of the JVM, um, honestly, the, the, the JVM has historically struggled a bit with the cloud native world. And the reason for that is because it comes from a different era. The JVM, you must remember, is well over 25 years old now. Um, it belongs to a world of people owning their own data centers or leasing their own data centers, hardware that they own with, with their own tin, with actual virtual machines running on bare metal, right? That's, that's the world that, that the JVM comes from. It's also worth noting that the, the nature of the, the Java runtime is, is not like C++. Yes, Java syntax looks quite a bit like C++. That's a deliberate choice, but it's also a trap. Back in the day, um, James Gosling and others deliberately made the syntax look like C++ to kind of trick C programmers and C++ programmers that they were running in a familiar environment. They absolutely are not. The JVM is a dynamic VM that owes, in some ways, more to Smalltalk than it does to C++. Okay, why is that important? Because it comes with it, this assumption of openness, of dynamicness, of reflection, of introspection, uh, of, of all of these things that we, we, we could do all of which are, are small talk uh, derived, of open class loading, of the possibility of modification of the program by loading a new class long after the, the, the VM has started. So typically what you see in, in, um, in this open world, which by the way, we call the dynamic VM. That's the phrase which I'm hearing a lot to describe this because we need a phrase for it because in this place, the second part of your question, what about native compilation? What about static compilation to, to machine code? 
okay, well, if we talk about that, if we're going to talk about static Java in a second, we need this other phrase, the dynamic VM, to mean the, the, the world that we all know and love. You start up, that you get the bootstrap, you get the initial class load of, of java.base. Um, you then start to find the main application class. You load that in the application class loader. It, it then bootstraps and loads a bunch more other stuff. Everything spins up, you JIT compile, you reach a steady state. And then in most cases, yeah, something can happen later and there could be a bit of deoptimization and a bit of change later and maybe some very late on class loading. But broadly, those phases are how it works. There's a startup phase, there's, there's, a, there's a bootstrap phase where everything hauls itself up. There's the application class loading phase and then the steady state. Um, that doesn't play well with, with cloud native when we are actually trying to start something very quickly. Um, when the process, the container time may live not for very long. It may be a function as a service and have a, a lifetime measured in seconds or even milliseconds. You know, that, that dynamic VM with that ramp up and that amortization of costs over time is not a good fit for it. So, so, so to really do cloud native, it's not just about connecting to whatever APIs Amazon off offers. It's about thinking how the cloud is different. You know, something like Kubernetes will spin up pods and create containers and destroy them and, and spin them up and tear them down. That's not in accordance with the, the life cycle of the dynamic VM that I was just talking about. So then the question becomes, what can you do to change the life cycle of the dynamic VM into something which is more suitable for cloud native? And that's really the point about native compilation. You have to do a lot, right? Because you, you have to not only take all the classes which you directly reference and AOT compile those to machine code. Well, that's it's, it's, it's not trivial, but it's not that hard. You then have to worry about every single reflective code path in your application, right? Because if you don't trap a reflective uh, uh, path at runtime, you'll get a crash. So at the moment, that's done by enumeration. You literally write down all the places where you make a reflective call, all the classes which need to be uh, um, AOT compiled for those reflective calls to succeed. And you have to package that and do that as part of the native compilation step. There are also other things going on as well, things like CRIU, um, and, and there's another project called CRAC, C-R-A-C. And what this is about is about, it's about checkpointing and restoring. Can you take a running uh, Java process, which is in flight and doing doing everything, and kind of freeze it and move it somewhere else in the network and then rehydrate it and, and have it start running again in exactly the same state as it was without reinitialization, without going through that life cycle? So this is a fundamental change. To do, the, to, to do this stuff, we're moving from, from having a dynamic VM to potentially having a closed world and something where we have to remove a lot of the dynamic aspects from, from Java. And at the moment, we're making progress. We have GraalVM. Obviously, there's the Mandrel project uh, and Quarkus, which I must, must mention, which is a fantastic runtime. If you haven't had a chance to play with Quarkus, take one takeaway, um, go, and, go and have a play with Quarkus, which is, is an, a, a native and a cloud native uh, and Kubernetes native form of Java, which I think um, has got a lot of, of really good ideas in it. And I think it's really in that, those spaces like um, Quarkus, which is available now, is production quality. Obviously, the Spring native folks are coming along as well. It's nice to see some of the some of the work that's coming out there. Um, I think it will probably be the end of the year before we see Spring Native in production, whereas you can play with Quarkus right now. Um, but it's like I said, it's good healthy competition, right? Um, so so yeah, it's an exciting time to be in cloud native um, and for, for native compilation. If you're interested in the guts and the details of how how all of it works, there's lots of work to be done. So you could come in and roll your sleeves up, or if you'd rather wait for a more polished product, I think in the next few months you should start to see some. Yes, some good outputs. Awesome. Where do we find the book? Ah, oh, this is now early access, right? Yeah. Well, so 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 my 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 my, my existing book, the one that's nearly finished, is the Well-Grounded Java Developer uh, by, by by Manning. Um, so if you just type Ben Evans and Well-Grounded, you'll find you find the second edition uh, just in, in in Google. And then my my new book, the one which which we're just announcing today, uh, is the eighth edition of Java in a Nutshell by O'Reilly. And that should be hitting early release probably this time next week. Looking forward to yeah, it. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Amazing session, man. I mean, so insightful. Uh, again, uh, we need to continue the conversation, definitely. I mean, it's, of course. Uh, we, we, we've just started. And maybe let's look for an in-person opportunity next time. I would I would love that. So hopefully this time next year, I should be, we'll be actually standing on uh, on, on on that stage together um, in person in Romania. 
Brilliant. Thank uh, you very much, Ben. Okay. Thanks, folks. See you soon.